thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. I plan to amaze you with facts about food and take the blinders off and expose some things that the food manufacturers really don't want you or I to know. So you ready to get started? <laughs> okay, okay, awesome. So I do want to say a big thank you to Cardiology and their commitment to these Heart to Heart series where we want to empower you with the latest information on health, heart, and vascular care. So we've got some exciting Heart to Hearts lined up in the future, and we'll tell you more at the end. Um, okay, so, um, you know, food processing. So we see it, you know, we have food all around us. We have it at the gas station, we have it at social media, we have it, you know, in work, in school. We see it on billboards, driving. We've got processed food all around us. Now, what do I mean by processed food? So let's, let's clear that up to start with. So, okay. So the definition for processing is any food that's been changed before it's been eaten in some way. So that's bagged, washed, milled, frozen, canned, that's processed. Now, ultra processed, that is a food that you can't recognize the original food that went into it, and it's got added sugar, salt, fat, additives, coloring, preservatives. So it's a food that is industrially sourced and processed. It's stripped of the wholeness that mother nature made in the food. It doesn't have the original vitamins and minerals and fiber and phytonutrients. Those are so key, but they're strict in the ultra processed food. Now, what are some ultra processed foods? Give me some examples. Potato chips, bingo. We're gonna talk more about potato chips. What are others? Like bologna. Bologna, yes. Yes. You can't see the original form. It's got added salt, sugar, lots of stuff, additives, coloring. Okay. We need processing. We don't need ultra processing. We need processing because we want to have all these foods available all year round. It's so nice to have, you know, these, these foods that we can make these wonderful recipes with all year round. And also, it helps us make meal prep quicker, which is important. Things like success brown rice, that's parboiled -bo brown rice, so that it only takes 10 minutes to make brown rice versus 40 minutes. We have canned beans, no added salt canned beans, so we can use those instead of soaking. We have frozen fish so that in 15 minutes, at 350, we can have a delicious meal on the table. We have bagged spinach that I can throw into a smoothie, an omelet, a bowl meal. All these things are great. So processing is wonderful and it helps us. Ultra processing is full of, it's, we will go back, sorry. It's full of fat, sugar, salt that is costing us in our health. Now I want to share a story and a study, they're both together, that will help make sense of what, we, what we're finding out about ultra processed food. So back in like 2015, the nutrition world was a buzz about, you know, ultra processed food, man, this is, you know, creating us, we're getting sicker and fatter, my goodness. And things were tumbling in about, you know, pointing the finger at ultra processed food. And this, um, this researcher, Paul, said, bah humbug. You know what? We're fatter and sicker just because we're eating more calories, fat, sodium, sugar. It doesn't have anything to do with this complex industrial processing that manufacturers are doing to put together a food that's more appealing to us ridiculous. So he just happened 
to be one of the researchers at NIH, National Institute of Health, with the metabolic lab. Now, what that is, that's code for dorm that subjects live in. So he set up a study there and a gold standard study. A gold standard study, that's like up here for studies. That's what you want. That takes a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of connections. But he set up a, a gold standard study where he took subjects and he paid them to live in the dorm for a month. They got $5,000. And he split them into two groups. One group ate for two weeks minimally processed food. And the other group ate, you guessed it, ultra processed food. Okay, so minimally processed was things like Greek yogurt. Um, uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, beef tender roast, uh, shrimp scampi with spaghetti. Sounds pretty good. And then the ultra processed were things like Eggo pancakes, Honey Nut Cheerios, Chef Cora D ravioli. You know stuff that a lot of Americans are, you know, they're staple. So next slide has an actual slide from the meal. This is an actual, this one here is a minimally processed and this is an omelet made with tomato, onions, and spinach, sweet potato hash, and skim milk. That's the minimally processed, sounds yummy. The ultra processed is eggs from liquid, pork sausage, and orange juice with added fiber. The researchers had trouble with the fiber, so they had to add it a lot of times. Because here's the thing, they matched all meals in the study for fat, carbohydrate, protein, sugar, fiber, and salt. They matched them. Pretty amazing, that took a lot of work. And the subjects ate for two weeks, then they're minimally processed or they're ultra processed and then they switched them. That's gold standard for two weeks. And they, you know, they were in the door. So they saw what they ate, they sent them down to the kitchens, they weighed it, they took all kinds of measurements, hormones on them, all kinds of stuff. And the results came in. And Hall was wrong. He was shocked. When the subjects were on the ultra-processed diet, they ate 508 calories more a day. So they, they ate 508 calories more and gained two pounds in the two weeks. Now remember, their meals were matched and they were told, eat as much as you want. And those, when they were on the minimally processed, they lost two pounds during the two weeks. You saw the meal. Paul found out that it wasn't just the calories and the sugar and the fat and the fiber. There was something else inherently in the food that was encouraging people to overeat. He was shocked. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, it's taste, Lisa. No, they controlled for that. They actually asked them constantly to rate the meals on appetizing and satisfying. And there was no significant difference between ultra processed and minimally processed. So what happens in the brain? What's going on here? Now let's go back, way back. Let's go back like hundreds of thousands and millions of years and think about this. We are programmed at our most basic level for two things, to survive and reproduce. Okay, we've had some times that have been tough and that survive thing hasn't has gotten close. So we have some learnings that have gotten into our instincts and our neural circuitry from the thousands and hundreds of thousands of years 
of learning how to survive and reproduce. We've learned a thing or two that's, that's ended up in our DNA and our genetic code. So it's kind of baked into us. And these, these learnings, they, they appear as what we call our primal motivations. Okay? So can anybody take a guess as to what our primal, what one of the three primal motivations is? <laughs> Self-preservation? Well, these all go towards that, yes. So, okay, one is pleasure. That's food and sex. Second thing is pain avoidance. So if it's snowing outside and we go out barefoot, we're going to run back in right away. Okay. We don't like pain. And the third one is energy conservation. We've learned that we can't be too inefficient with our energy. Otherwise we will perish. So those are our three primal motivations. So let me tell you a story and let's go to nature to kind of understand how these primal motivations have been hijacked with ultra processed food. So let me just go to nature first. Let's, uh, let's say it's a nice summer evening and the sun has gone down and you step out onto your porch and you flip the light on and you take in the peaceful surroundings and you notice something's flying towards the light. Moth. Moths are flying towards the light that you flipped on. Now, moths' main navigation system is the moon. For thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, that's what they've relied on is the moon for their navigational system. But now, the brightest light in the sky is your porch light. So they're fluttering towards it and they hit it smack, and they get disoriented, and they flutter down. And then they go back towards it, hit it smack, get disoriented, and flutter down. And they do this over and over and over, and eventually many of them die. Now what's happened is we messed with their environment. The moths think that they are biologically successful when they're actually self-destructing. They have no clue. This wiring for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years is telling them to go to the light. And it's killing them. We've, through this environment with the light on the porch, we have hijacked their instincts and they're doing something destructive and they have no clue. So how does that translate to ultra processed food? So let's do some conversion there. Oh, so in there we have a super normal stimulus is what we introduce with the light. A super normal stimulus that they were then self-destructive when they thought they were being biologically successful. So let's switch to ultra processed. So right now we are intaking about 57.9% ultra processed food. That's the average right now. Now if you're a teen, it's 67%. Now the other 40% is a mix. It doesn't mean the other 40% is minimally processed. Okay, processing is on a spectrum. Okay, minimally processed at one end and the other end, the ultra processed. Studies clearly show that we thrive our health on minimally processed that are bursting with vitamins and minerals and fiber and phytonutrients. The ultra processed taps into our pleasure center in our brain. It gives us a super natural pleasure hit, eliciting a high dopamine hit. 
Now think about it. This is a new environment that for hundreds of thousands of years didn't exist. And all of a sudden we've thrown ourselves into this environment and we have this super high stimulus from the ultra processed food. We are getting hijacked like the moths. Now we think that this is good. We're getting tricked into this is good because we get pleasure. <laughs> but instead it's destructive, very destructive. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, Teresa, I like pleasure. I deserve pleasure. And I, I want to live a life high on pleasure. And you know what? It's okay if I'm sicker. It's okay if I'm fatter. It's okay if I live a few years less. See all the pleasure I get? That dopamine hit gives me pleasure. But I got some bad news. That pleasure doesn't stay. Okay? So let's go back to our primal motivations. We've got pleasure that's programmed into us. We are drawn to pleasure. So we're going to be drawn to wanting that pleasure and that dopamine hit, that euphoria, and it's complex. There's oxytocin and there's serotonin and stuff like that. But we get this pleasure high in our brain that we haven't been getting for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. And we want pleasure again because we're wired for that. But our brain comes back and says, you know, I've learned a thing or two and I'm not going to give you as much pleasure the next time. So you're not going to feel as much pleasure. They call that the pain pleasure balance. And you are seeking the same pleasure, but you're not getting it. Your body gives you pain as a way of enticing you to go for pleasure again. It's this loop that continues. You want pleasure, so you go for it again. But you get less, and you, I want to go for it again, and you get less. And you keep wanting the same pleasure you got the first time, and it's not there. Who now has less pleasure, but you pay through sickness and obesity? Your brain is now dulled because it's become, it's called habit, habit, habituation or neural adaption where we're used to the stimulus. The ultra-processed food hijacks our normal pleasure-seeking primal motivation. It disrupts our normal fullness and satiety signals. We're wired for thousands of years. We have a new environment that's messing with it. Now, you might get lucky and you might hear about a cooking with heart class that, you know, just happens to restore your normal brain pleasure in balance and, and teach you to listen to your fullness and hunger signals. But more on that later. Okay, in the 60s, food manufacturers starting to get started to get together, psychologists, marketers, uh, flavor engineers, scientists. Now notice, there's no chefs on this. They did not get together chefs. They got together these experts to try to learn how to get you to eat more. More than what you want to. 
to eat the whole box, to eat the whole package. And there's, there's a famous guy, he's a mathematician, and his name is Howard Moskowitz. And he, he started out several decades ago with the goal of finding out how to create powerful cravings for food. He was first hired by the Army. The Army came to him over three decades ago and said, ah, we need your help. We've got these rations in the field and soldiers, they're eating them and then for a while after that, they just eat half and throw away half and they're not getting the calories they need. We need you to help with this. So that was his first gig. And he discovered, discovered this kind of contraindication that is present with us that's called sensory specific satiety. And what that means is that big distinct flavors, after a certain point, they overwhelm the brain and your desire grows less for them quickly. Now, mundane foods that don't have any, you know, outstanding flavor, well, you can eat more and more and more of that and not feel full. Doritos and Coca-Cola came out of this. <laughs> what, bro? <laughs> <laughs> they, they pique your taste buds, but there's no single, single flavor that really says stop to the brain. Now, of course, there's a lot of other engineering that goes into Doritos and Coca-Cola, but that's one of the concepts that helps you overeat or overdrink on them. Howard Moskowitz is also responsible for this term called bliss point. It's the amount of any ingredient or combination of ingredients, meaning sugar, salt, fat, to make the food the most enjoyable to eat and nearly impossible to resist. So you continue to eat, ignoring your own body's natural stop signals. That's the bliss point. Now the point is, food manufacturers, they know what they're doing. They've got formulas to do it, okay? One of Howard Moskowitz's first products took 61 formulations, 3,900 taste tests across the country. And a lot of money. But it made a lot of money for the company. Now recall in the 60s the phrase, bet you can't eat just one? Well, that was the 60s, okay? Back then we were just starting to see ultra processed food, but now we've got ultra processed food everywhere. It's hard to resist. And we're, you know, we have to eat. So that's another problem. So we're faced with it all the time. It wasn't a problem, but now it is a problem. So another concept to do with ultra processed food that is important to understand is about flavor and dissipation. When food manufacturers create flavors, they know that the flavor has to dissipate, disappear quickly. Let me give you an example, orange. You peel an orange, you take a section, you bite off, you get that spurt of orange flavor and you eat that, and it's delicious. Food manufacturer, not interested one bit in recreating that because Mother Nature's flavors last way too long. The speed of the flavor is super important. It, it has to have craving architecture. That's a real term. <laughs> the hallmark of an addiction is the speed. The faster, the more likely you will lose control. Your willpower will go. What happens with the speed is you light up your reward center in your brain. Now, you thought the salt on the chip was for flavor. Uh -uh. Maybe just a little bit, but mostly it's there for speed. The speed to light up 
neurologically. It's not the taste, the manufacturer. It's the neurologically going to your brain. It creates a strong craving for more. It goes to your brain, it disappears, and you go, oh, I want another, and another. It's a hit. Salt and sugar, they've documented travel to your brain in less than one second. Cigarette smoke takes 10 seconds. Alcohol and drugs take between one and 10. Food is the fastest. Oh, did I mention who bought big food companies in the 80s? Philip Morris bought Kraft. Reynolds bought Nabisco. By the 80s, they had at least three decades of research on speed and nicotine. You can connect the dots. Now, I'm not here to bash food manufacturers, but I'm here to make you aware that they don't care about your health because they have to answer to stakeholders. And stakeholders want profit. And being responsible is it profitable? Now, I want to add a couple more things before I go into some solutions, and I have some solutions, so the good news is coming. But um, studies, as far as studies go, we really don't have a lot study-wise, except for that Hall study. Now, there's some in the works, and Hall realized after his study that he had some things he wanted to research more. Um, but a lot of the research that's been done has been done by the food manufacturers and it's under lock and key. And it really is not the kind of research that we could publish in peer reviewed journals. Um, what we have been able to do is comb back through some of the bigger kind of data pools sets of subjects. There's one called the nurses study that was in three different cohorts and has over 100,000 subjects. And one study went back through and looked at whether the foods that people said on diet recalls, this is diet recall, so people had to like remember and record to the telephone interview. So you know there's a few problems with that, but um, it's the best we got. So um, they went through and they categorized the data as minimally processed or ultra processed. And what they were looking at was weight gain. And over the 20 year period, the average weight gain was between 16 and 17 pounds. So they wanted to look at the foods that were the highest correlated. We see correlated, it doesn't mean causal. It doesn't mean we can blame them. But it means, uh, it gives us a clue, okay? So we can start to know where to research and look. So they wanted to find the top foods that were responsible for those that gained the most weight. And they found the top foods were French fries, potato chips. Oh, there's those potato chips again. Um, Red meat, processed meat, and sugar-sweetened beverages. Any surprises there? Mm -mm. So then they also looked at what foods seem to be associated with not gaining weight, okay? And the top foods there, now it's tricky because even categorizing foods sometimes gets tricky. <laughs> so, but what they were able to find was yogurt. And they think the bacteria in that's good too. So, you know, live cultures, the bacteria are really good for you. That's a whole nother lecture I can give. And um, fruit, whole grains, and guess what was in your snack that you had? Yogurt, fruit, and a whole grain called chia seed. Now I know that's new to have on top of your yogurt, but hey, you know what, chia seeds, two tablespoons have 10 grams of fiber, four grams of protein, 18% of your RDA for calcium. Whoa. So just sprinkle chia, okay? So you got those three in your snack. The other one that they found was nuts, okay? So that's all we have to go on at this point for studies, really. I'm sure others are coming. Now, I want to, one more thing I want to share with you, and that is I want, to, I want to profile one food so you get a feel for what really is in a food, okay? 
and I'm going to pick the potato chip. Okay. Okay. So the t the the salt on the outside. Now, like I said before, you think it's for taste. Okay. Mm, just a little bit is for taste. Most of it is to deliver the speed to your brain. Okay. So that you get a hit and you want more. Second thing it's used to is to cover up odd flavors. There's some off notes in processed food. Uh huh. When you get to like 20, 70 ingredients, some of those 70 ingredients, guys, you're going to have some things that could taste off, will taste off. So if you were to eat a potato chip without salt, it would taste disgusting. If you got down to 50%, 50 you would still be turned off by it. So the fat, well, fat is fat. That's nice. That's mouthfeel. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. The starch, well, that's kind of a misnomer, starch in a potato chip, because you think, oh, that's potato, it's starch. Uh-uh, this is hydrolyzed, industrially processed starch. Do you know the starch in a potato chip will raise your blood sugar higher faster than an equal amount of sugar? Okay, so it's not really starch. They make it that way purposely because that is also a great hit. Raising your blood sugar that quickly, you're gonna crave more. Now the crunch, did you know that the crunch, that Oh, that that crispness of the bite. It's called the break point. That you need to have a forty thousand dollar machine to measure that. Okay, so nobody's kitchen is gonna have that. Okay, and that we like it at four pounds per square inch. Okay, studies show they do lots of studies to figure this out. And the noise it makes. The noisier the chip, the better. We think it's fresher if it makes more noise. <laughs> I know. So they do a lot of things to give it a good crunch. So the potato chip is a perfect addictive food. The next time you reach for legs. Okay. So move on to solutions. I want to start with, okay, what happens in your body normally for fullness? So we have two systems that we want to pay attention to. One is slow and one is fast. The fast one is in the stomach, in the um, cells lining the stomach. They are reading volume and stretch. So that's the first signal you're going to get. It's neural, so it's fast. It goes to your brain. So you'll have a sense of the volume of the food that you eat. The second is hormonal. And this takes place both in your stomach and your small intestine. And that's slower. The cells in your stomach and your small intestine are reading, they're releasing hormones and trying to read, get a sense of what you're eating. In other words, are you eating amino acids? That's the breakdown product for protein. Are you eating fatty acids? That's the breakdown for fat. Are you eating glucose and fructose? Those are the breakdown for sugars and carbs. So because it really wants to say, hmm, am I going to be able to go for four hours? Is this going to keep me busy and fulfilled and have calorie, you know, density a little bit to take me four hours? That's what it's looking for. Okay. So that's the hormonal and that is slower and that will give you a reading about 20 minutes after you've started. You've heard that maybe before. You've got to wait 20 minutes to know if you're full. Well, that's the hormonal signals are gathering their data, okay? They're trying to track what you're eating. So it's going to take some time. So keep that in mind. So how do you go about reading your fullness? Well, there's a tool that I use a lot. Next slide. This is called the hunger fullness scale. So you don't need to memorize this, but just know that it goes from one to 10. Um, you never want to be on the outside. You want to be four to six. That's where you really want to be most of the time. Five means, you know, I don't feel food in there, but I'm not getting hunger pains right now. So you're, you're neither. 
And then six is, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling some fullness in there. Okay. Now you don't want to get to a full smack upper seven. You can just start to touch to seven, okay? But usually we want to eat till we're just slightly full, that six, because we're going to bump up in 20 minutes. Watch it, set the timer, see how that works. I challenge you to try this out for three days. Just pilot test it for three days and ask yourself how hungry you are before every time you eat for three days and start to notice 20 minutes later. Oh, yeah, I was a little more full. I could feel that. Now, hunger, you want to wait until your hunger is at a four. If you get down to three, you're going to overeat most likely. You're going to be really hungry and everything's going to taste great. Okay, you eat quickly. Four is a better place to be where you can pay attention to the flavor and the fullness and not eat as quickly. So four to six. So practice that. Test it out. Be curious and see how that goes. So different foods are going to affect people differently. Um, and you know, we're all different when we're doing this kind of retraining of our appetite. You know, everybody has a different craving reward architecture to you. Uh, we have different physical bodies. We have different meds we're on. We have different chronic conditions that we're battling. Um, and you know, so don't compare yourself to somebody else. Just get to know you and try this out and see what happens. Now, if you um, want some help with slowing down and paying attention, because most of us are kind of mindless going throughout our day, and it is really hard to stop and go, she said, pay attention to my hunger. Oh, I messed up again. I didn't. I just ate that, gulped it down. So here's some habits to help out with transitioning. So on the slide, I've got drink of water. So take a drink of water, which reminds me, I want to take a drink of water. So between bites, take a drink of water. That might help slow you down. It might. You know, try these out. It's not going to work for everybody. Put your fork or spoon down between each bite. Now, if you're going, Teresa, that sounds really nice, but uh, that's not going to work for me. I eat fast. I can't do that. So another one is to take the food on your plate, and before you start into it, divide it in half. I mean, put half, you know, the potatoes, half the asparagus on each side of the plate, and eat half. And when you're done with half, put your fork down and say, okay, how full am I? Am I still hungry? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not hungry, but I'm not to that six that she said yet. Okay, okay. So then you want to divide in half again. Don't eat all that other half. Divide it in half again, you know, asparagus, potatoes, and eat that half. And when you're done with that half, really, we're down to a quarter, then ask yourself again, how, how full am I? Am I there yet? I think I'm there. Well, then you can push the plate away and finish there. Or you might end up going, you know, take four to six times, depending on how much food you got on there. But the idea is you're purposely slowing yourself down, paying attention. So you're understanding if you're actually full. Now, again, you want to go till I call it slightly full. It's 80%. If you want to think 80% full. There is a Japanese proverb that says eight parts of food sustain the man, of the stomach sustain the man, and two parts sustain the doctor, okay? So you want to eat just the eight parts because you're going to go into unhealthy areas if you eat the last two. So those are just some ideas. Um, chewing well, that's the last one there. And this isn't about like helping your stomach chop your food up. Okay, your stomach doesn't need any help there. What it is is think about it for hundreds of thousands of years we have been actually chewing our food. We have been. <laughs> We've been chewing 15 to 30, 30 times on average. Now we're closer to 10. Now that doesn't sound like a big difference, but it is. Okay. If you, if you calculate the hundreds of thousands of years and our body, actually, it's all attuned for this. And actually when we chew, we are basically telling the hormones in our stomach and our small intestine to get ready. Food's on its way. Okay? So it's not really that you're helping chop up your food, but it is really all a process that your body has done wonderfully for hundreds of thousands of years, and we just now have changed on it. So, okay. 
So let's see here. Oh, this last one is a really good tip for how many of you want your food to taste more pleasurable, enjoyable? Okay. The best thing is allow yourself to get hungry. It's the best way to season your food so it tastes great. Your taste buds are the most sensitive when you're hungry. You know, I think the Aristotle said the best seasoning is hunger. When you start to get hungry, you want to eat within 30 minutes, ideally 30 to 60. When you get 60 and beyond, we're probably at that three, okay, on the scale. That's too hungry, okay? So just know that if you start to get hungry, you go, oh, yeah, okay, half an hour, 45. I can do 45 of something, okay? So, and it will just sit down and enjoy because it's going to taste, your, your taste buds are the most sensitive then. And actually, we have a great system where it actually gets less sensitive as you eat. Remember that satiety sensory uh, uh, principle? That's what's in play there. It's your way of your body steadily telling you, okay, slow down. We're getting close to that stopping point, okay? So, those are some. Um, some things to keep in mind the next time you sit down to eat. So um, now the last thing I want to talk about is when you're transitioning to newly processed food, there's some things you need to be aware of. It's kind of like um, the withdrawal, okay, we're going to talk about. So if you're at 80% ultra processed and all of a sudden you go cold turkey, guess what? In 24 hours, you're going to be grumpy, okay? <laughs> so and that will taper off about a week. Okay, so I'm just saying, you may not be at 80%, but just be aware that you might see some grumpy, grumpiness. Um, your taste buds take about two to three weeks to overturn and adjust and lower your threshold and become you know, more sensitive to lower salt, lower fat, lower sugar. Okay, so be gentle with yourself. Food might taste just a touch bland. Okay, that's an adjustment. That's okay. You guys got two or three weeks. You can deal with that. So you may or may not notice it. Again, if you're not really tasting your food, you may not even notice it started to go a little blander in between there. But eventually, it will taste full of flavor. It will come back. And you'll be like, oh, that's too salty. Ugh. You'll get one of those, you know, uh, frozen soups at the restaurants. Ugh. Yeah, and they'll come to your table piping hot, and you'll take a taste, and you'll be like, oh. That's so salty, okay? That's good news, okay? So um, so some things to keep in mind when you're transitioning. So um, I'm winding up, as I wind up here, I just wanna keep in mind a couple key concepts. And that is, I want you to be curious. One of the best ways I find in life is to be curious, like these two kids here, they're discovering, they're finding things for the first time. Just keep that kind of mindset as you go about this, discovering new things. Keep an open, curious mind. No judgment, no comparing. So just, hey, you know what? This is a little bland right now. I know. She said it's going to be a little bit till I adjust. And wow, this has flavor I never even noticed before. That's cool. So just be curious and be open and then be compassionate. You're going to overeat, guys. You're going to overeat. Okay? So. We're programmed, so don't get mad at yourself. Everybody struggles with this. We're all figuring this out. So be compassionate. Just pick your feet back up and what's the learning here? She said, okay, that's right, that's right. So, okay, I can give that a try. Maybe I need to go out a little slower. Um, so be compassionate. You want better for yourself and it's a journey. It's gonna be a journey. Last thing is really try to tune into your internal fullness and, and hunger signals. And I say that because there's so many things that are gonna try and overtake you. You have social things that people are gonna try and get you to eat when you're like, oh, I'm not really hungry right now. <laughs> or you're gonna see the clock and go, you know, it's that time to eat. Well, maybe it's not the time to eat. Or you see food and you're gonna be like, oh, that sounds great right now. So, just know those are extra, what we call external cues. And then there's some internal ones like stress, boredom, negative emotions that can get us, okay? And that's, you know, that's where you have self-compassion, guys. Just be aware, curious, and over time, 
they will get less and less, but you have to be self-compassionate. So just keep these in mind as, as you go on this journey. I want to mention again um, about my Cooking with Heart. You have some information in your packet there, but um, the next class that I will be leading will be August 9th. Uh, I'd love to have you in the class. I'd also love for you to invite somebody. It's always more fun with somebody. So you can invite a significant other, a sister, a mother, or a small group. So right now it is um, virtual. We are hoping sometime in the future, sometime, to have them in person back in our cardiac kitchen. But for now, we do still have a lot of fun online. So it's all free. And you get the binder. It's four weeks. We do 16 plus recipes in four weeks. It's pretty awesome. And we have fun because, you know, you've got to have fun on this journey. So, uh, and we focus on low-cost meals. And I know right now, whoa, low-cost is really nice right now. So we do, because I know that's, that's important. And, you know, I got four kids to feed, so cost is a big factor. I know how that goes. Um, okay, so in the end, I want to say thank you for your time. But before we go, I do want to, I know we're up at the hour. I do want, if you have a moment, I would like to do a mindful eating exercise with you and lead you through how to pay attention to your food and really savor it in a very pleasurable, normal way, balanced way. So I have um, volunteers that are handing out a dub chocolate right now. And just don't, don't, don't open it until I give you the cue. Um, but this will take five minutes and I will stick around for any questions that you have. While we're doing that, I do want to do the raffle. Kathy has grabbed the, uh, the raffle prize there, and we're gonna do a drawing there to see who won. We've got Pritikin seasoning and Pritikin salad dressing and an apron, so all kinds of goodies there. So, okay, everybody have their ticket handy? Did you get a ticket? Okay. Oh, you got one? Okay. Okay, and let's see, five, Six, six, four, five, four. Anybody? It's got to be somebody in here. <laughs> right here? I don't know what was the number. Okay, five, six, six, four, five, four. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So, okay, so um, you've got your, everybody have a dove chocolate? Okay, wonderful. So, okay, um, I want you to just um, take a moment to just kind of get into a kind of slow down, mindful place. And if you want to, you can close your eyes. I'm going to close my eyes uh, so I'm not distracted. So, and just take a deep breath in. Let it out. And I want you to think about how hungry are you right now? Let's just take note now. Are you like a five where you, you don't really sense that you have food in there, but you're not hungry? Or maybe you had dinner before you came and you're at that six, seven, going up towards the seven. Or maybe you haven't had a chance to have dinner and you're closer to the, the four. So just take note where you are. Now go ahead and take the Dove chocolate and go ahead and unwrap it. Don't eat it yet. Wait for my cue, but just unwrap it. And I want you to listen to the sound and feel the wrapper. Just pay attention to the whole experience there as you unwrap it. Now, I don't want you to take a bite, but I just want you to take the Dove chocolate up to your nose and take a nice little <laughs> sniff and down. Don't eat it yet. I know it's very tempting. But I want you to note any memories or emotions that come up for you. Just whatever comes to mind. Just, you know, observe. Become aware. Now this time, I want you to go ahead and go in up and just take a bite and then set it down, but hold the bite in your mouth. Do not swallow and do not bite. Just hold that bite. And let it just melt right there on your tongue. And notice the flavors. 
And notice, does it like melt all at once? Or does it slowly disintegrate onto your tongue? You can swirl it around a little bit if you want to. I don't want to be choking either. <laughs> so if you need to go ahead and swallow, but slowly take it back to the back of your throat and follow it down as you swallow as far as you can go to your stomach if you can. Just follow it down. Now, open your eyes. For this second bite, I want you to just go ahead and take a bite quickly and swallow it and set it down. So just go ahead. Do it a couple times again, and we don't want to have to do the high leg. So, and go ahead and swallow, just gulp it down. So now you've experienced two different experiences. You had the first one where we savored it. And you had the second one where we ate more kind of what we're doing kind of normally. So which one was more pleasurable? First one. Most are going to say the first one. You were mindful. You were present. You paid attention to it. And the second one is kind of what we're doing most of the time. Now, the point isn't that I want you to slow down and eat every bite like that first one. No. I want you to take what you learned and think about how can I incorporate that in for me? Because those are gifts that you have available to you every day, every meal, every bite. And we're just letting it go by. It doesn't cost you anything. And just think, that was kind of you know enjoyable. That was fun to really experience that food. And that's okay to love chocolate, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with pleasure. I just want you to have it in a balanced way where you're mindful and you're paying attention and you're not allowing some other wiring to be hijacked and to overtake your, your instincts that have been there for thousands of years to tell you to stop and that you're full. So can you incorporate the first couple of bites even of a meal, maybe savoring like this? Or can you have a meal a week or two that you just, you know, put the candles on, you put the music on, and you just phones off the table and you enjoy? You choose, you know you. But this is a gift waiting for you. And when you start to pay attention, you will be amazed at the food that you like and that you don't like. And it's a gift there that it doesn't cost you anything. And you will learn to stop when you're just full rather than overeat more of the time when you're more mindful to your eating experience. So thank you so much for your time. I do want to make a note that the next Heart to Heart is going to be July 12th, and Dr. B. Reddy is going to be talking about fasting. It's a fascinating talk, so he does an awesome job. So we'd love to have you here for that. Um, you've got information in your uh, gift bag about that coming up, So um, and registration is open. And, and we will have the lipid panels available at that one and we will have blood pleasure and a big thank you to those in the back that the blood pleasure. So, and I also want to yeah. want to thank um, the foundation mm -hmm. our Trinity Health Foundation it's funds from them that allow us to cover the cost of these events the lipid panels the food the treats and such so thank you Mary McCumber Schmidt she's president of the foundation back there member of that team over there and Sharon Nash also. So yes. thank you all.